All right, it's four o'clock. We'll get started as more folks make their way in here. So let me just say good afternoon and uh, glad you came back. Glad to have you. Glad I have someone to talk to you. Here's what I want to do. I want to have our time of prayer in just a moment. Uh, so what I'd like to do is highlight one of our state missionaries, and then I want to highlight an unreached people group for us to be praying for as we get started. Uh, so first, let me uh, read a profile to you of uh, one of our state missionaries named Allie White. Uh, Allie was raised in Clinton, South Carolina, and she serves in East Africa with the Sub-Saharan Africa Cluster. She grew up at First Baptist Clinton, then she moved to Lake Jackson, Texas after graduating from Newberry College. Allie worked in a church there until 2020 when she was commissioned and sent to East Africa. After a short stateside assignment in 2023, Allie has returned to East Africa in July to start her Macedonia term, is what they call it. And this means that she will be serving as an apprentice with the IMB, uh, our International Mission Board, while she attends seminary online. Allie works alongside national believers as they share the gospel and do discipleship among vulnerable women in red light districts. Okay, I want you all to listen to this. They have the, the Whitestone Training Center where they work with women who are seeking to leave prostitution. The women are trained in job skills such as hairdressing and sewing. They go through counseling and most importantly, they're discipled. And a little bit more about Allie, it says she enjoys coffee, running, and baking. So she and I have two things in common, uh, not so much the running part anymore. Listen to ways we can pray for Allie. It says, please pray for the Whitestone Center, as they have six new women who are seeking to leave prostitution, and they start their classes soon. So pray for them to accept Jesus as their Savior, and for wisdom from God for the staff of that center as they lead it. Also, we can pray for Allie that she would deeply abide in Christ as she continues to live and work in dark places. I can only imagine. It says, pray that she would cling to Christ as her comfort and the lifter of her head. And then also pray for Allie as she starts seminary. Pray that God would give her wisdom and excitement to learn more about him. So we'll pray for her in just a moment. I also want to share a little bit about an unreached people group that I just did a little research about it this week. Uh, I think I may or may not be pronouncing this correctly, but we will call this people group the Bisu, B-I-S-U, the Bisu people group. Uh, they are a people group in Thailand. My favorite detail about this people group is their world population is 800. So this is a people group of 800 people, uh, less than the... I believe that's less than the population of Chapin proper. Is that correct? Yes. So, uh, so it's, this is just remarkable to me. There are 800 people that belong together in a distinct way as a people group. The percentage of evangelicals in their population, 0.00%. Uh, there are a handful of BCs who I, I guess have professed faith in Christ, but not enough to uh, raise that percentage in any significant way. They do have the New Testament in their language. Uh, they have an online audio New Testament available for them as well. The Jesus film is available. Other audio recordings are available uh, for them. Listen to what their lives are like, just a little bit about them. Uh, most aspects of the Bisu village life revolve around their zealous appeasement of evil spirits. So that's their worldview that they have to appease or satisfy evil spirits. They do all they can to keep peace with demanding demons. This traps the Bisu in dire poverty as numerous valuable livestock are wasted in needless sacrifices. Few groups seem to be so serious in their devotion and so bound in their fear of evil spirits as the Bisu. Every part of the Bisu culture includes spirit appeasement. The Bisu desire to live at peace and believe that ignoring the demon's demands will result in suffering, sickness, and disaster. 
And so when we read of something like that, I, I want our hearts to go out for this people group to think that um, that is, uh, that's the worldview of the ideology uh, that they're shackled by. Here are some of their needs. Of course, you can imagine some of them. Not many people have tried to take the gospel to the Bisu, uh, despite the presence of Christians in that region of Thailand. There are a small number of believers in, uh, I believe it would be called Menglian County, including a few B.C., but the majority have absolutely no awareness of the gospel. Uh, so we want to pray, obviously, that the gospel uh, would reach them. Uh, as you would imagine, the handful of Bisu who have embraced Christianity, it says they have invariably experienced severe persecution from the other Bisu in their communities. So here are ways we can pray for them. Pray for the Bisu that they would see that they do not have to live in slavery to spirits, if they put their trust in Jesus Christ. Also, we can pray for the Lord to intervene in their families, calling entire families to his side. Let's pray for loving workers to be sent to share the gospel with them. And then, of course, let's pray for their hearts to be drawn to the Lord of Lords. So I want to ask you, if you'll bow your heads with me, we'll begin tonight with this prayer for both Allie White and for the Bisu people group. Let's pray. God, I'm thankful for the power of prayer. Lord, we know it would be so easy uh, to feel as if what we're doing right now might, might seem insignificant, might not have much of an impact on things, but that would be bad theology, Lord. Theologically, we can rest in the effectiveness, the power, the mystery of prayer, I pray that we would grow in our faith as prayers, as intercessors. So we unite our hearts, Lord, bringing to you Ali, one that came from our own state and has gone to Africa to do ministry. We thank you for her calling. We want to pray for this ministry, Lord. We pray for white stone, especially for these six new women, these students that are about to start classes soon, Lord, as they are trying to leave prostitution. That's one of the most heartbreaking statements that can be made. I pray, Lord, that they will experience you as their rescuer, as their redeemer, not just as the one who rescues them from their difficulties, but also as the one who is willing to forgive them of their own sins as well. May they come to know you as Lord and Savior. I pray for wisdom for the staff of this ministry. God, we pray for Allie that she would abide in you. Lord, we can imagine that she might uh, battle loneliness or, uh, or isolation or difficult circumstances, homesickness. Lord, help her to rest in you, to, to abide in you, that you would be her comfort. We also pray for her as she starts seminary. Lord, we thank you for those aspirations Help her to enjoy her learning experience. Use it to equip her more for her ministry. And God, we want to lift up the Bisu people group in Thailand. Some 800 people made in your image, precious in your sight, almost completely isolated from the light of the gospel of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Almost literally no connection or access to the good news. So God, we ask that you will providentially and sovereignly send loving workers to the bee suit to share the gospel with them. We pray that you would overcome their worldview, that they would see that in Jesus Christ, they can have freedom, they can have deliverance, they can have spiritual liberty and they don't have to be shackled to attempts to appease demons, but they can celebrate the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. The one whom the demons believe in and shudder, Lord. I pray that the authority of Jesus Christ would be experienced and received among the Bisu. Lord, we pray for their hearts to be drawn to you. God, we pray for the family units of this village, this people group, that you would save whole families, much like you did the jailer in Philippi, that you would bring whole families into faith and that it would spread. 
God, now we ask that you will bless our time in your word. We thank you for scripture. We thank you for the gift of being able to come and study your word and just take another look into it. I pray, Lord, for those who are here that they would uh, benefit from this time, that they would enjoy it, that they would glean helpful insight, that we would be better equipped as small group leaders and teachers and disciples and friends and conversation partners. And so we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we finished last week having gone over just sort of thinking about why did God provide for us four gospel accounts? All right, why not just one? Why four? Why multiple gospel accounts? Why Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? And if I were to try to summarize uh, the best answer in summary form, it's to give us this multifaceted, well-rounded, very rich uh, life theological biography of Jesus, who is our Lord. So it's just to give us layered and textured narrative of who Jesus is, what he's done for us. But I feel like if we ask why four gospel accounts, it begs a question by implication. In that case, why only the book of Acts? Why just one? And all I can do is surmise. I need to be very clear with that. I am not trying to give you this conclusive statement beyond all doubt. No, all I can do is basically think out loud with you for a minute, just surmise, why would God see fit to give us four gospel accounts, but then only one account of the early church? So obviously, that's what God desired. He gave us four canonical gospel accounts. He gives us one canonical narration of the early church. So here's a guess. Was this a way to make sure that we appreciate the priority of Christ over his church? Christ is the head. All right, we're the body. It's just one speculation. Was this a way to make sure we appreciate the priority of Christ over his church? He gives us a multifaceted biography of Christ, one account of the church. It's just a guess, it's a theory. I would encourage you to ponder some theories too. If you come up with some good ones, uh, reach out to me sometime. And I'd love to hear what you think. I think it's an interesting question. I also want to add this. We have to appreciate that the book of Acts, it gives us a narration, okay, of the early church, but it's accompanied by other canonical works. There are 22 other New Testament works that can be seen as accompanying the book of Acts, right? The type of ministry that we see unfolding in the book of Acts, we see those reinforced in the letters being sent. So I want to make sure that we understand it's not like Acts is just all by itself. It's just the only narrative account of the early church. Okay, so that's, that's the best I've got on why there's only the book of Acts. Another question, don't know if you've ever asked yourself this, why Luke and Acts? Okay, in other words, why would God see fit to give us this two-volume work that is Luke and Acts? Or you might even say Luke dash Acts. It could just be considered one work, two volumes. Again, all I can do is surmise, simply guess. I'm not even sure if it's all that educated of a guess, but here it is. Perhaps God wanted one of his gospel writers, in this case Luke. Perhaps he wanted one of his writers to produce the Acts account to ensure that there's a tangible link between the narration of the life of Jesus and the narration of the early church. Just, just a guess. Perhaps it was important to God that one of his writers gave us one gospel account and then the canonical narration of the early church. So there's this link. Okay, there's this connection through the writer Luke. Now, speaking of the link, speaking of the connection, this is where I really want us to kind of take the meat of this lecture and realize how the book of Acts has, I think, a powerful and rich relationship with the gospel account. So what I want to do is I want to give you three uh, big points. Let me go ahead and mention them. Then we're going to spend some time in each one of them. So if you're taking notes, go ahead and get ready to write these first three points here. 
Number one, the book of Acts extends the narrative of the Gospels. The book of Acts extends the narrative of the Gospels. I'll show you why I say that in just a moment. Let me give you the second point so you can go ahead and fill it in. The book of Acts expands upon the scope of the Gospels. The book of Acts expands upon the, go- the scope of the Gospels. And then third, the book of Acts exemplifies the plot of the Gospels. The book of Acts exemplifies the plot of the Gospels. So let's take a few moments in each of these. This is me trying to help you get a big picture of Acts and its relationship with the Gospels. First, the book of Acts extends the narrative of the Gospels. Let me just invite you to go to the very first verse of the book of Acts. I want us to kind of go slow at first. So let's look at chapter 1, verse 1. I want to take pains to make sure that this connection is clear. There is a preface connection as we see the book of Acts connecting back to the book of Luke. So in Acts chapter 1, verse 1. In the first book of Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Let's just refer to that. That's sort of like Acts preface. That's the preface for the book of Acts. Now, if you will, go with me to Luke I've read this to you multiple times. I want you to see it again. Let's look at how the book of Luke begins. The preface of the book of Luke. Of course, you will notice that the same name of the recipient occurs. Let me remind you how Luke starts. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Okay, so there I'm simply just showing you uh, concretely that there is a connection between the preface of Luke as being a writing for this recipient, Theophilus, and we talked about Luke's journalistic approach Uh, to starting his gospel and now we see that he refers to the first book as he begins the book of Acts and he refers directly again to Theophilus saying I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach I heard a a sermon recently uh, on on a podcast where the preacher just reveled in the fact that that word began has such significance that Jesus was continuing to do work all through the book of Acts. Things have shifted, though, doing it by his Holy Spirit through his followers. So there's that preface connection, okay? That's one way where we see the book of Acts extending the narrative of the Gospels. There is a continuation. Okay, let me show you another way. What I want to do is I'm back in the book of Acts, I'm back in chapter 1, and I'm simply going to begin reading in verse 2. I'm just carrying on. What I want to do is read from verse 2 through verse 11, and then I want to show you a connection back to the book of Luke. So look at me, uh, look with me at Acts chapter 1, verse 2. Until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and the cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now, what I want to point out is, up until this point, it's all leading up to the ascension of Jesus. Jesus has been crucified. He's been resurrected. Now we see him ascended back into heaven. So let me take you back to Luke with me, but go to the last chapter of Luke. Go to Luke 24. What I want to show you is that everything that I just read to you in the beginning of the book of Acts 
is accounted for in some way in the Gospels as well. If you go to Luke 24, uh, let's just start reading. Uh, let's start reading in verse 46. Get a little context here. Jesus said to them, this is Luke 24, beginning in verse 46. I'm just going to finish the book of Luke. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven, and they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. Now, I'm arguing that the book of Acts extends the narrative of the Gospels, and I'm wanting to show you how it does so by having these links between the account of Jesus telling them they're going to preach to the nations and the account of Jesus being ascended in the book of Luke, and then in the book of Acts, we see that same thing being narrated as well. So there's a preface connection that we saw in verse 1, and there is a narrative flow that extends the Gospel account as you see it in comparison to Luke chapter 24. So here's an observation. I find it intriguing. Maybe you will as well. The beginning of Acts, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, the beginning of Acts connects directly to both the beginning and the ending of Luke. All right, to me that's intriguing. When Acts begins, we see concrete connections to the very beginning of the book of Luke and to the very end of the book of Luke. All right, so what might, be, what might be an implication of that observation? Well, perhaps it shows us one way that the book of Acts is related to the entirety of the book of Luke. I want us to see how strongly connected Acts is to Luke, and therefore, how strongly connected the book of Acts is to all four gospel accounts. It has a connection to the entirety of those accounts, especially, of course, with the book of Luke. So the book of Acts extends the narrative of the Gospels. In other words, what the Gospel was unfolding just continues on. Redemptive history is continuing to unfold. Okay, my second statement, the book of Acts expands upon the scope of the Gospels. Uh, the book of Acts expands upon the scope of the Gospels, this is not to ignore the Great Commission. It doesn't get much broader than that. When Jesus says, uh, you're going to make disciples of all nations, that is worldwide, that's as big as it gets. So I'm not trying to ignore the Great Commission, but what I'm trying to argue is that the book of Acts actually reinforces on that and embarks upon it. So, so the Great Commission is how the Gospel accounts end, of course. And so now we see the book of Acts embarking on that, and we see multiple ways how there is an expansion from what has taken place in the gospel accounts to what we see happening in the book of Acts. Let me point out a few of them. In the gospel accounts, in summary, you see one man, Jesus, entrusting his message to 12 men. Okay, and so in the book of Acts, that number 12 has to be completed. Okay, we see Judas replaced by, by Matthias, so you have one pouring all of his energy and all of his ministry, almost all of it, into these 12 men, and then he is releasing them, okay, sending his spirit with them. So we have from 1 to 12, and that we also notice it's really 120. If you're, if you're in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 15, it says, in those days Peter stood up among the brothers, and there's this parenthesis, this explanation, little context. The company of persons was in all about 120. Now, this would be men and women. I have a footnote. Your Bible may have a footnote as well. Uh, this is often the case. When you see the word brothers, that the way that it's written, it really could be translated brothers and sisters, and I think it's appropriate to realize that this company of persons would have been men and women who are followers of Christ, and we're told that all in all, it's about 120, which, if nothing else, I find it to be intriguing math. Because we've gone from one man in Jesus pouring his life and spirit into the 12 men, his apostles sending them out, then we see that really 12 times 10 is the math that composes what we would consider this, this core of the early church. So even the math, in my opinion, just shows us that there's an expansion happening. 
Okay, then you come across Acts chapter 2. Uh, if you're familiar with the book of Acts, you already know what this is. This is the day of Pentecost. What I simply want to point out is how we see this expansion unfolding in real time. So in Acts chapter 2, uh, let's just go to uh, verse 7. Uh, so let me just give you a little context. God has sent his spirit upon his followers just as he promised. That's the tongues of fire part, the first part of the chapter. But this crowd that has come together is hearing all this, and it says they're amazed and astonished, saying, are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? Okay, so aren't all of these from just, let's just use the phrase people group, aren't these all from the same single people group? Then they go on to marvel at this, verse 8. How is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both the Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. So even there, you see the expansion demonstrated through how one language speaking group is being used in this miraculous prophecy moment to display the gospel through all the languages represented in the world's gathering there. So that shows expansion. If you go to Acts chapter 10, just kind of flip there with me for a quick second. Acts chapter 10 is where Peter uh, was up on the roof praying and he sees this vision of a, like a blanket or a sheet being let down with all sorts of animals he's told to kill and eat. He says, no, I, I've never eaten anything unclean. And the Spirit of the Lord shows him that he can't call anything unclean that God has deemed clean. And so he is called to take the gospel to the Gentiles. So let's say Acts chapter 10, verse, go to uh, verse 44. Peter has just essentially preached to the household of Cornelius and all who he has gathered to his household. It says, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. So this is going to sound a lot like what we saw in Acts chapter 2. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. So now we see that there is this expansion from just the people of Israel onto Gentiles, the nations as well. Uh, Paul's missionary efforts demonstrate expansion. Let me take you on a tour of that. First, let's hop out of the book of Acts. Let me take you to Galatians 2, uh, chapter 2 real quickly. Look at Galatians chapter 2 with me, verse 9. Let's see, let me back up to... Uh, Verse 7, Galatians chapter 2, verse 7, Paul says, On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised, work also through me for mine to the Gentiles. I want to remind you again, I hope that you almost roll your eyes because I keep reminding you, when you see the word Gentiles, you're seeing the word nations. That's the expansion that I'm trying to point out. So Peter was called to the circumcised. Paul's being called to the nations. There's an expansion. Verse 9, when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles or to the nations and they to the circumcised. So that, that's his way of summarizing that, that God is expanding the gospel work in the book of Acts through Paul's life and ministry. So now here's what I want to ask you to do. Let's go to book of Acts chapter 13. Let me just kind of do a little hopscotch. I just want to show you little pieces where you can see that the ministry of the gospel is continuing to advance. Or to put it another way, the book of Acts is showing there is an expansion upon the scope of the gospel accounts. So in Acts chapter 13, verse 2 and 3, let's, let's go up to verse 1. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, 
Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So the idea is now Paul is off to the races in his missionary calling. If you go to verse 48, I want to make sure you see that there's a typo in your notes. It should say verses 48 to 49. Let me just read those two verses for you real quick. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. So God's continuing to spread the gospel throughout more and more uh, of the region. Go to chapter 14, see verses 5 and 6. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding country, and there they continued to preach the gospel. So they, they get run off, they just keep going, they keep preaching. Chapter 16, verses 6 through 10, find that. We read that a couple weeks ago, the Macedonian call. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mycenae, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mycenae, they went down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And I read that text a couple weeks ago to show you that this was the first of what we call the we passages, where you realize that Luke is now a participant in all this ministry. He starts to use the first person, we, us, so on and so forth. I'm reading it to you now just as an example of where the ministry is continuing to expand. If we go to chapter 19, let's read verses 8 through 10. Chapter 19, verse 8, And he entered the synagogue, and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. This is in Ephesus. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. So, I think it's safe to summarize that essentially they got run out of the church, the synagogue, so they just rented a hall uh, for those who wanted to gather, and he kept teaching. And look at what it says in verse 10. This continued for two years, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Because Acts is expanding upon the scope of the Gospels. All right, look at chapter 28, the last chapter of the book. I'm sure we could have found more. I just wanted to select several of them to show you the, the, the flow of this, of this narrative. In chapter 28, let's, uh, let's begin reading in verse 23. Paul is in Rome. He's basically under house arrest, something like that. And it says, when they appointed a day for him, they came to him. That's a bunch of Jews. Came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God, and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. And just, just to make sure we're clear, uh, that's an indictment. Is it, you're not going to hear it, you're not going to see it. So like, I think back to this morning when I prayed. I prayed in light of Jesus' parables where he talks like this, where he gets it from the prophet Isaiah, that we would have ears to hear and eyes to see. Paul's saying, yep, Isaiah said you wouldn't, and you don't. So look at what it says in verse 28. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. In other words, these people representing Israel, they were hardened to the gospel. He says, therefore, it's going to keep being preached to all the nations. He says, they will listen. 
I would even suggest that the way the book of Acts ends could kind of hint at some form of uh, expansion. It says he lived there two whole years at his own expense. He welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Maybe my favorite two verses in the book uh, of Acts, but it just, I pointed out before, it just shows us that ministry is continuing. It's just expanding. And let's not forget where he is. He's in Rome, which I think in a very real way in their day and age, if you had given them an atlas and showed them Jerusalem, Rome would have felt like the ends of the earth. And so even the fact that he's in Rome hints, not just hints, it demonstrates that the book of Acts is expanding upon the scope of the Gospels. Now my third statement, as a reminder, the book of Acts exemplifies the plot of the Gospels. We're going to get into that in just a moment. Uh, Let me give you guys uh, an opportunity to take a deep breath. Let me give away some books. Uh, So we're going to give away some things here. I'm going to give away a copy of... I need a, I always need a color reminder. Huh? One more time. Are what? Not teachers. See how good our communication is on staff? All right. Okay, this book, Discipling, again, the uh, subtitle, How to Help Others Follow Jesus. Now, remember, I gave a copy of this book to our teachers Because I want you as teachers to realize your ministry contributes to the discipleship of those in your class, okay? So I hope you read it with that uh, parameter in mind. This one is going to Sale Lewis. I just saw, there he is. Congratulations, Sale. This one... We'll go to the library of Allison Bailey, right over here. Congratulations. We'll just do it right over Chad's head. There you go. Let's do a couple more. Did y'all hear my knee pop? I'm not getting younger, y'all. This one belongs to Rob Cornforth. There he is. Congratulations, sir. Let's do one more of these. Robin Paycheck. Where's Robin? There we are. All right. Congratulations. All right, let's see. I want to give away a copy of the gospel, how the church portrays the beauty of Christ. Billy Gardner, there you are. Let's do one more of these. Jeff Hilton, all the way. You're one of the winningest people in the history of the Ember Lectures. If you keep winning, we're going to have to name this like the Hilton Memorial Ember Lectures or something like that. All right, I'll give away a few more in a few minutes. Let's kind of get back into it. This, uh, this third statement, the book of Acts exemplifies the plot of the Gospels. Now, what I'm about to do is, is really give you a retread of something I shared a couple years ago. So two years ago when we had the Ember Lectures on the New Testament. So just as a reminder, the first year we did it, we did four sessions on the Bible as a whole and uh, just approached how do we interpret it, things like that. Then we started to narrow it down. So the next year we did Old Testament. Then the year after that we did New Testament. And then last year we did Pentateuch. So here we are in the Gospels and Acts. So that means two years ago, I shared these notes with you. So I'm going to give you these again because they're about the book of Acts. And I figure that uh, unless you have been studying fervently those notes all two years, like you probably would benefit from a refresher anyway. I doubt you really remember all this unless you have been continuing to look at those notes, which would be amazing and surprising all at the same time. But here was an argument that I make, that I made two years ago. I taught this to a group of leaders in Brazil uh, last year. I still believe this. 
I believe that Acts is the gospel account of the church. Now remember, we define the gospel as theological biography. So what I mean when I say Acts is the gospel account of the church, I mean that God gave us in the book of Acts his theological biography of the church. So I believe that the book of Acts has a very similar sequence or pattern to the gospel's biographical accounts of Jesus. What I mean is, and I pointed this out a couple weeks ago, the gospel accounts tell us about prophecy regarding Jesus, his birth, his ministry, which includes his teaching, his preaching, and his miracles, opposition against him, his arrest, his sentencing, his execution, It also gives an account of his resurrection and his ascension. I believe the book of Acts does something very, very similar. I believe that the book of Acts gives us prophecy about the church, shows us the birth of church, elaborates on the ministry of the church, its teaching, its preaching, its miracles, shows us that there was opposition against the church. It shows us in a form the arrest, the sentencing, and the executing of the church, which is destined to carry out her mission unto eternal, resurrected, and ascended life. Let me just kind of say that over again, then we'll go over these piece by piece. The book of Acts narrates the prophecy, birth, ministry, opposition, arrest, sentencing, executing of the church, which is destined to carry out her mission unto eternal, resurrected, and ascended life. Very, very similar to the sequence of the gospel accounts with one significant twist at the end that I'll try to point out. So first, again, we'll kind of start slow. But I want to show you how the book of Acts provides prophecy about the church. Now, I just read a verse a few minutes ago from Acts chapter 1. It's verse 8. I would like for you to look at this as a prophecy about the church. It's Jesus... So Jesus is saying words about the future to these early believers. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I believe that you could look at that as a prophecy. Uh, You might even hear an echo where it says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. That sounds a lot like what the angel tells Mary that the power of the Holy Spirit would overshadow her when there's this prophetic preparation for the coming of Christ. We hear something that I believe echoes that in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. There's another uh, encounter with prophecy in chapter 2. I didn't read these verses earlier. I started reading uh, in verse 7. But if you read chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, then I think you see this encounter with prophecy taking place. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and they filled the entire house where they were sitting. Now remember, it helps to realize, to remember, that in Greek, the word for wind is the word for spirit, okay? Kind of adds to the layer of of prophecy that we can see in here, that connotation. So they filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So that that is prophecy taking place. The Holy Spirit has come down like fire. You could almost, you know, you could almost recall the the story of Elijah uh, with this miraculous calling down of fire before the false prophets of Baal. Now here we have the Holy Spirit coming down as tongues of fire on each of the followers, filling them with the Holy Spirit, and then they speak in other tongues. And we just saw that it amazed the people. That is a moment of prophecy. So I would show, I would argue that the book of Acts provides prophecy about the church. Okay, next, the book of Acts narrates the church's birth. Uh, I will will trust that many of you have familiarity with how uh, the rest of chapter two unfolds. I'm not gonna read this entire account to you, uh, but Peter does stand up and preach a very powerful sermon. I do want to highlight verse 41. 
It says, so those who received this word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And I would say to me, that's sort of like the church. That's the birth of the church right there. Okay, I feel like once we have that, we kind of have this culminating moment where God has now established the early church. Uh, to me, that's, that's the church's birth. So we see that there is prophecy about the church. We see that the book of Acts narrates the church's birth. Uh, next, similar to the gospel accounts, the book of Acts shares some memories of the church's childhood. Okay, uh, Matthew and Luke show us occasions of Jesus' childhood, especially Luke. And uh, wouldn't you know it that the same writer in the book of Acts, I think he gives us memories of the church's childhood. Let me point them out. Hopefully you'll find this to be um, a defensible argument here. In chapter 2, right after those 3,000 souls are added, look at what it says in the next passage. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. I think we can read that as just this summary account of what, what was it like in the first days of the church or the church's childhood. We see growing pains. If you go to chapter 6, we see the early church having to navigate growing pains. They have a problem, but it's a problem that results from the growth of the church. Uh, Acts chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Let's just read the first seven verses. Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists, okay, that, that's Greek-speaking Jews. You may have a footnote that explains that. There was a complaint by the Hellenists that arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Right, it's grown so much that the, the logistics are getting difficult. So verse 2, it says, And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples. That's a lot of people now. That's thousands of people at this point. They summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So they had to learn, okay, how do we navigate this? Well, the, the apostles realized they had a priority that they could not, they could not um, neglect. They need to carry out the ministry of the word. They need to carry out the ministry of prayer. This was important. This was a very important problem. It doesn't get more urgent than starving widows. I mean, that's super urgent. We've got to figure this out, right? And so they said, church... You need to pick from among you seven men. What an interesting number. They have to be spirit-filled. They have to be wise. And then we will appoint them to this duty. Okay, verse 5. It says, what they said pleased the whole gathering. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Achaner, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Again, I think we have an episode of the church's childhood there. Uh, in chapter 10, now I mentioned this a few moments ago, this I, get, I believe again is the church kind of learning how God has designed it. So Peter is now called to take the gospel to the nations uh, I read to you verses 44 through 48 earlier. That's sort of like the culminating passage of this moment where now we realize that the Jewish Christians are learning that God has intended to take them unto the nations. It's something they should have known from the Old Testament, uh, but they had to learn it. So they have a lot in common with us. Sometimes God has to patiently reteach us lessons. But I would say Acts chapter 10 is another episode that shows us uh, kind of like the awkward preteen version of the church. You know, there's still plenty of imperfections and blemishes and all that, but it's coming into its own. Uh, then again, in chapter 15, I think we, we see another example where uh, they're having to learn more and more about how God has designed them to be, there is this controversy in Acts 15 where some believers are saying, now that the Gentiles are coming into the faith, then the Gentiles also have to be circumcised in order to be following Christ. And it created this controversy. 
And, and thank the Lord, uh, what they ended up deciding is, no, that does not need to be the case. And they wrote a letter to encourage Gentile believers to tell them you don't have to be circumcised. Let me just take you to the last part of this letter. In Acts chapter 15, verse 28 and 29, they say, For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled, And from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do do well. Farewell. Again, I believe another episode where we see the church just kind of growing into more maturity. So the book of Acts shares some memories of the church's childhood. Okay, next, the book of Acts shares the church's teaching and preaching. Just like the gospel accounts. Give us plenty of moments where Jesus is teaching and preaching, so too does the book of Acts. Shows us how the church taught and preached. Let me just walk over these real quickly with you. I've got them all in your notes. In chapter 2, Peter preaches at Pentecost. In chapter 3, Peter preaches in Solomon's portico. In chapter 7, Stephen preaches and gets martyred. Chapter 8, Philip teaches and baptizes the Ethiopian eunuch. Chapter 9, Saul begins preaching. Chapter 10, again, Peter preaches to Cornelius' household. In chapter 13, which we'll look at later, Paul preaches at Antioch. In chapter 16, Paul and Silas teach the Philippian jailer. In chapter 17, excuse me, in chapter 17, Paul preaches at the Areopagus, or Mars Hill. In chapter 26, Paul testifies before Festus and Agrippa. And in chapter 28, Paul preaches to the Jews in Rome. We just looked at a part of that. I think that that's a fairly exhaustive list of where you'll find the teaching and preaching ministry of the early church throughout the book of Acts. Uh, I would say most likely there's some other pieces that we could have pulled in there, but I'm pretty sure I try to be pretty exhaustive with that, just walking through the book and identifying all the places where we see that the book of Acts shares the church's teaching and preaching. Okay, next. The book of Acts demonstrates the church's miracles. The book of Acts demonstrates the church's miracles. So in chapter 2, as we've seen, uh, the disciples are speaking in all the languages of the world in miraculous fashion. In chapter 3, Peter heals the lame beggar. In chapter 5, Peter sees, he sees through Ananias and Sapphira, meaning if you're not familiar with that story, he sees through their lies. Uh, really in miraculous fashion, and they end up dying right there on the spot. They just fall dead. Um, I would consider that a miraculous work, a very eye-opening one. Uh, Again, in chapter 5, there are many signs and wonders. We're even told that Peter's shadow uh, has the power to heal, really, through obviously through the power of the Holy Spirit. In chapter 9, Peter raises Dorcas back to life. In chapter 14, Paul heals a crippled man. In chapter 19, aprons and handkerchiefs that touched Paul were then taken to provide healing ministry to those in need. In chapter 20, Eutychus is raised from the dead or at least raised from near death. Uh, Depending on how you read the way it's put, he either was dead or he seemed dead. Uh, Either way, it seems like a pretty miraculous account. Uh, And it's a funny one. As a preacher, it's a very funny story. Uh, Chapter 28, Paul survives a snake bite. And again, in chapter 28, right after that, uh, Paul heals the people of Malta. That was also kind of a humorous uh, moment because they see this man who's just been shipwrecked and he gets bit by a snake while they're putting together a bonfire. So then they, in their, uh, I guess, animistic worldview, they think, "Uh uh-oh, he's a goner, he must be an evil man. A snake just bit him. And of course, then they're awestruck when he just shakes it off and keeps on trucking and then he heals some of them. So those are, I believe, a pretty exhaustive list of how Acts demonstrates the church's miracles. So just like Jesus performed miracles, obviously some of these are very reminiscent. Uh, uh, Matter of fact, almost all of them are very reminiscent of the kinds of miracles we saw Jesus perform in the gospel accounts. Okay, next. The book of Acts includes the church's opposition. Okay, so it includes many accounts of how the church was opposed Chapter 2, the apostles are mocked at Pentecost. They think that they're drunk. In chapter 4, Peter and John are held by the council. In chapter 5, the apostles are arrested. In chapter 6 and 7, Stephen is stoned. In chapter 8, Saul persecutes the church, but the church keeps spreading. 
Really, because of the persecution, the church keeps spreading. In chapter 9, there are failed attempts to kill the newly converted Saul in Damascus and Jerusalem. I mean, one of the biggest ironic swings uh, of, of plot there is now he's being chased because of his new faith in Christ. In chapter 12, uh, 12 James is killed. Peter is imprisoned. Chapter 14, Paul is stoned and left for dead. That one is just one of the most vivid accounts for me to think about them stoning him to the point where they presumed him dead and walked away from him. Uh, and yet he, he was able to get back up and went right back in to do ministry. Chapter 16, Paul and Silas are thrown into Philippi's jail. In chapter 17, some at the Areopagus mocked the resurrection. In chapter 19, a riot broke out in Ephesus. Uh, it gets so bad they fear that Paul's going to be torn apart. Uh, you may recall that detail. And then in chapters 21, or at the very end of chapter 21, through the end of the book, chapter 28, verse 31, what we see, in very similar fashion to Jesus' account, you see Paul is arrested, tried, then he's sent to Rome, he's kept in custody, where, according to tradition, he is eventually killed. Okay, so let me kind of recap those. I just pointed out how the book of Acts provides prophecy about the church. It narrates the church's birth shares some memories of what we might call the church's childhood. It shares the church's teaching and preaching ministry. It demonstrates the church's miracles. And it includes the fact that the church experienced repeated opposition. Now here's where I want to point out something that struck me recently. There is a difference between the gospel accounts and the book of Acts. The book of Acts does not complete the church's story as far as the gospel accounts take the biography of Jesus. In other words, unlike the gospels, the book of Acts narrates only up to the arrest and sentencing episodes of the biography. All right, so what I mean is when the book of Acts ends, Paul has gone through this whole rigmarole of being arrested and tried and then taken to Rome and all this, and he's held in some form of house arrest, something like that. And then that's where the biography ends, right there. That's where it stops, okay? The book of Acts does not carry on to anything that we would call a resurrection or an ascension or an intercession. The gospel accounts do. The gospel accounts show Jesus arrested, sentenced, executed, resurrected, then ascended, where he is now interceding, carrying on his ministry as the intercessor, our advocate, that's where the gospel accounts take us. The book of Acts does not. It stops before the resurrection. Other portions of the New Testament contain sort of forward-looking uh, passages to those things. We see other New Testament documents that talk to us about the resurrection that can give us uh, this hope for an ascension, I think, like 1 Thessalonians 4. And then even when we think about the intercession, what is that? Well, if we think about our intercession to look forward to. It's just when we'll be with the Lord, okay? But the book of Acts stops before that. I want us to think about why. Why would God, who inspired the scriptures, providentially see fit for the book of Acts to finish when it does in this biographical sequence? I would say it's because the story of the church is not finished. Now think about this. We are still in the crucifixion stage of the story. I really want us to appreciate this tonight. I want to get kind of very briefly devotional in this moment. We are called to take up our crosses daily and follow Jesus. We're still in the crucifixion stage. We're still in the stage where we have to die to self, where we have to realize that the life that we live, we don't live it on our own, that we have to receive Christ's life. He has to live in us that's just the stage of redemptive history that we are in. So we are still looking ahead to a resurrection, still looking ahead to our ascension, and then our intercessory, putting that in quotes, our being with the Lord and with his people for eternity. Now, I want this to inform you as a disciple, and I want it to inform you as any role that you have in ministry or teaching or leading others, we are called to cruciform discipleship. That simply means we need to die to self. We need to take up our cross. 
and we need to follow Jesus. That's what we're called to do. We are called to hope in our resurrection. We're called to hope in our ascension into glory forever. But we are called to a cruciform discipleship. And if you are a small group leader, an elder, a deacon, some sort of a mentor, a discipler, a parent, we are called to cruciform ministry. Which means that in a way not much different than Paul at the very end of the book of Acts, we have to realize that our calling is to proclaim the kingdom of God and to teach about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness, doing so in a way we're willing to die, we are willing to die to ourselves for the glory of Christ and for the sake of those who need to hear the gospel. And I think that the book of Acts is instructive that the way it ends shows us where we really still do fit in redemptive history. All right, so that is, uh, that is uh, me kind of reintroducing you to the idea of how the book of Acts is the gospel account of the early church, uh, the theological biography of the early church. Okay, let me give away some more books for a few moments, and then uh, we won't be too much longer after this. I'm going to give away a couple more copies of Discipling. Olivia Lang, I saw some Langs over here, all right. Congratulations, Olivia. Just as a reminder, she was one of our devotional authors for our Advent devotional. All right, one more of these. Gus Strasberger, I saw him in the back. There he is, all right. Congratulations, Gus. There you go, sir. Absolutely. And let's see. Let's give away some more copies of the gospel. We'll have fun at the last one. I got one more little moment here. But we're going to close with a few more giveaways. We're going to start to give away some of the power tools. All right, this copy of the gospel is going to Naomi Niger. Where is Naomi? There she is. Congratulations. And then, oh, we're going to stay right there. We're symmetrical. We're good. All right, I'm going to do just a few more minutes. Then I'm going to come down, give a couple of these away. I think I might even give one of those away tonight. But I've got to keep most of the big guns for next week because I need someone to come back. Okay? So let's take a few more minutes. I, I was thinking that tonight might be a little quicker than normal. Uh, and, and hopefully I didn't just doom us by saying that out loud. I think we're good. This, this rest of the part will not take long. Give me just a few more minutes. I want to share some things I think just might be helpful in just kind of getting a grasp on the book of Acts, really just sort of big picture things. Let me give you a, help, a helpful outline of the book of Acts. Let me make sure you realize, I think you have this footnote. This outline, uh, I've adapted it from a, a book called uh, From the Cradle to the Cross to the Crown, which was a giveaway two or three years ago. It's a huge introduction to the New Testament by Kostenberger, Kellum, and Quarles. Those were all three at the time, uh, teachers at Southeastern Seminary. Here's, here's an outline that they give. I've just adjusted it a little bit. So they give us seven uh, phases. The first phase, getting ready. That's what I call it. Chapter 1, verse 1 to chapter 2, verse 47. Uh, the second Phase would be uh, the early church in Jerusalem, chapter 3, verse 1, through chapter 6, verse 7. The third stage they refer to as initial expansion. Uh, you have the Stephen martyrdom, uh, sermon of martyrdom, then you have uh, Samaria, and then you have Saul being called. So you have this expansion. Things are starting to really kind of uh, ramp up. That's chapter 6, verse 8, through chapter 9, verse 31. And then you have what they call the fourth stage, the continued expansion. Uh, the Gentiles are converted, and they identify that as beginning in chapter 9, verse 32, through chapter 12, verse 24. Uh, then you have stage 5. They refer to as to the nations part 1. They got three parts. So part 1 is Asia Minor. Asia Minor. That's chapter 12, verse 25, through chapter 16, verse 5. Then the sixth stage is to the nations, part two, that's Greece. 
chapter 16, verse 6, to chapter 19, verse 20, and then to the nations, part 3, Italy, chapter 19, verse 21, to chapter 28, verse 31. Now, I'm going to give you one more little piece of information, and it may feel confusing. That's fine if it does. But Kostenberger, Kellum, and Quarles, uh, among many others, okay, this is not original to them, uh, but they do, they are of the belief that they can identify three missionary journeys for Paul. In case you're wondering, some feel like there are three, and some feel like there may be just two, but they identify three, and I've given you the, the uh, range of passages. So the first one will begin in chapter 12, verse 25, through chapter 14, verse 28. Then the second missionary journey is chapter 15, verse 36, through chapter 18, verse 22. And the third one is chapter 18, verse 23, through chapter 19, verse 20. What I want to make sure that is clear, but then could lead to some question marks, those do not coincide with the part one, part two, and part three that they just identified. So that Asia Minor, Greece, and Italy, that is not missionary journey number one, missionary journey number two, missionary journey number three. No, that Italy fits after those three missionary journeys. So the three missionary journeys actually fit into the nation's part one and two. So as a helpful exercise, kind of an intriguing one, I would encourage you to find, find where those, ver- those passages, those, uh, those passage ranges start and stop and just try to get your bearings a little bit uh, and see what you think about that. But that is a helpful outline of the book of Acts. Uh, And then let me give you some, what I believe are key passages in the book of Acts. I would say most people probably would say chapter 1, verse 8 is the most famous uh, verse in the book. I do know that um, in From the Cradle to the Cross to the Crown, I believe they highlight it as what's called the key verse. Uh, But that's the verse where Jesus says, it's the prophecy that I read earlier, but you will perceive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Well, that's essentially like the outline or, or at least the, the trajectory of the book of Acts and then, of course, of the Great Commission itself. So chapter 1, verse 8 is certainly a key passage. Uh, then I've kind of highlighted several chapters, and I know that you could pull more out. You could identify more chapters. Obviously, all 28 are important. Uh, but chapter 2 with Pentecost is important. Uh, chapter 6, if you'll just glance at chapter 6, uh, that, oh, we already did earlier, that's where they realized they needed to kind of do their logistics a little bit, uh, kind of uh, ramp those up, and they started what we would consider the prototype of the deacon ministry in chapter 6. Chapter 7 is Stephen's speech, uh, really in one sense you could call it a sermon, which would end up having him martyred. Chapter 9 is key because that's where Saul, who is... Uh, really hell-bent, and I don't say that tritely, hell-bent on uh, uh, ravaging the church, he encounters Christ and becomes a missionary. That's chapter 9, chapter 10. We've talked about that multiple times. That's where Peter is called to take the gospel to Cornelius. And we realize that this really is going to the Gentiles as well. Uh, Chapter 13, I want to take a moment there. Go to chapter 13 with me. This is one of my new... This is sort of like my, my favorite fresh find uh, in my study um, preparing for this is what we encounter in chapter 13. If you will, just humor me. I want to read this passage of scripture to you. I want to read verses, well, we'll probably start in verses 13 all the way through verse 41 because I would like for you to know that this is here as a very helpful summary of redemptive history a very helpful summary of the Old Testament and as it flows into the New Testament. Uh, So I just want you to, if you'll just allow me to read this to you, uh, and after this, I mean, it's just going to be a matter of seconds pretty much, and then this lecture will be over. So just kind of follow along with me. I want to read Acts chapter 13. Let's begin in verse 13 all the way through verse 41. And just kind of note this, if you like to highlight in your Bible, Note this as a very helpful summary section. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia. John left them, returned to Jerusalem, but they went on from Perga and came to Antioch and Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Now, what we have here is an example 
I wonder how many times he said this almost exactly in the synagogues. Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. Okay, y'all know where we are now? We're in the book of Judges. All this took about 400, well, we're in Joshua. All this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, what do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but behold, after me, one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb, but God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he says also in another psalm, you will not let your holy ones see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. And that's how he ends the sermon. And don't you love verse 42? As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. I mean, they just begged the preacher to preach again. You got to love that. So I want you to highlight that passage. Very, very helpful. Well, for all the right reasons, too. It's a very helpful summary. Uh, but I mean, maybe underline verse 42 and kind of pray about that. Uh, then, of course, back to our key passages, chapter 15. I've already highlighted that where they had to kind of wrestle through is circumcision required or not for someone to follow Christ and they made the right decision. Let me finish this, this session by just giving you final thoughts on the book of Acts. This would be uh, just my way of kind of summarizing what happens in the book of Acts in just a little bit of a packaged uh, set of statements. First, the church is made. The church is made. Second, the church is sent on mission. The church is sent on mission. Third, the church is forced on the move. That's persecution. The church is forced on the move. And then fourth, the church is multiplying. That's what we see happening in the book of Acts. The church is made. The church is sent on mission. The church is forced on the move. And the church is multiplying. So, hey, it's, four, it's 514. I'm going to give away some books, and then I'm going to pray, and we're out of here. All right, let's see. Let's give away a copy of John Piper's book, A Peculiar Glory, subtitle, How the Christian Scriptures Revealed Their Complete Truthfulness. Okay, so this one is going to go to one of our small group teachers, just as a thank you to their ministry. This one is going to Sam Rivera. I feel like he's over here. I feel his presence over here. Congratulations. You are welcome. Thank you. Let's give away one more of these. And 
this one will go to Mike O'Mara. I got you. He sends his runner. Congratulations, sir. All right, let's see. Let me, I'm not going to give these away yet. I want to tell you what they are. Maybe this is what will convince you to come back next week. But I am going to give away two copies um, of a book called Jesus and the Gospels. It's an introduction and survey by Craig Blomberg, who's very much just a well-known uh, name in New Testament scholarship. I got to say, I don't have this, so I will be jealous next week when, when a couple of you get it. And then this is a commentary, but it's a neat kind of commentary. It's a geographic commentary on the Gospels. So the idea is as you're studying the Gospels and you come across places and regions and all this stuff, anything geography related, there's a commentary about that. So I'm going to be giving those away, and I'm going to be giving uh, most of these ESV study Bibles away. I'm going to give away one tonight. Just going to, we're going to prime the pump. Okay, but let me explain this. So for the last three years, I think, I've been giving away these Bibles. They've been, they've been going only to small group leaders. Okay, so that's why we have two bowls. So like as a way to say thank you to you small group leaders, we're giving you guys most of the power tools, right? Well, if I am correct, all of our current Sunday school teachers have one of these. So I'm going to be giving these away to really the rest of us. So you guys are in the drawing for an ESV study Bible, uh, large print, Okay, that's key, because you're not getting younger either, all right? So we're going to give one away tonight, and then I'm going to pray. So this ES, by the way, there's lots of good study Bibles out there. I have several. This is my favorite. It's really, really good. Uh, I hope you'll find it to be a blessing. This ESV study Bible is going to Rebecca Ward. Where's Rebecca? All right. Congratulations. Enjoy that. Listen, guys, I want to thank you for coming uh, so much, and uh, hope you can come back next week. Next week, we're going to kind of go back and try to look at the Gospels, maybe from some different angles than what you're used to looking at them at, and uh, I will give you a little bit of warning. It'll be kind of nerdy, so just come ready. Come ready to be a nerd with me, okay? Let's pray. God, we thank you for loving us by sending your son. Uh, thank you for loving us first. And we, we know that yeah, you deserve our love, and you deserve more love than we give you. So we pray for your grace to love you more. Lord, I thank you for uh, the gift of being able to come tonight and uh, just spend some time with a part of our church family in your word. Lord, we thank you for the book of Acts. We thank you for its relationship with the Gospels. Uh, we thank you for our relationship with the book of Acts. And so I pray, Lord, that we're faithful we're faithful to the great commission calling that we see uh, being unveiled throughout the book. We pray that we're faithful to our part in it as we continue to proclaim the kingdom of God and to share the name of Jesus Christ unto the ends of the earth. God, I want to pray your blessings on every person in here, every family represented. Just as the week coming up, as we think about the week ahead, whether it's work or other Life matters, Lord, I pray for health and safety. I pray for good quality family time. Uh, I pray, Lord, that we are also fulfilled in our callings. And we look forward to coming back next Sunday with our church family to worship. So uh, until, until then, Lord, may we stay uh, resting in your presence. Looking forward to worship again. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night, y'all.